right, here we are. We are back. We are live. What's going on, y'all? Good. <laughs> Good to see you. Great to have you here. Thank Lisa you. Manfie. Nice to see you again, Derek. Not involved with the antivirus software at all. No wishing <laughs> related to the crazy uncle, but I'm not. <laughs> Rick Sidley from Cornerstone Mortgage Group. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you what I've seen. So kind of what we're here to discuss today. You know, buying real estate in San Diego, obviously, um, something a lot of people, everybody wants to do. I mean, I can't think of anyone who doesn't want to buy a house mm -hmm. in San Diego. Right. Um, the question is, can they afford it? You know, is it possible? Is it feasible? And is it a good time? That's the biggest question I get with regard to real estate is, what do you think you should buy? Are you buying? Who's buying? Are you buying? <laughs> or is it just a good seller's market? Well, it's been a seller's market for a number of years. Correct. Um, that's what we've been told. That's what we've heard. I've seen recently, I track a lot of properties. Um, and... And I, I just, I do it very simply, just use Redfin, you know, my favorite properties, and then I get updates from Redfin when things happen on this property, whether they go into escrow, or they come off the market, or whether they sell, or whatever. Yeah. So this is, that's my only method, I just want to make that clear, of tracking the market. I don't actually gotcha. work with buyers and sellers. <laughs> <laughs> but I see what happens to these properties. And one of the things I've seen a lot lately, especially in some of the areas that are considered to be hotter, like Carmel Valley, for example, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of price reductions. And when I see price reductions, um, it makes me think, maybe this market is shifting a little bit. Maybe buyers should be paying a little bit of attention. Perhaps sellers aren't as much on their high horse as they used to be. Yeah. Maybe things are leveling out a little bit. Of course, that's why you guys are here to tell me whether I've got it right or whether I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you might be a little crazy, <laughs> but I don't know you well enough to say that. Um, <laughs> For me, Maybe we'll get there by the end. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, yeah. You can judge me later. <laughs> um, for me, selling real estate every day, and this is what I do full time, um, it's still very much a seller's market. And there's a couple of factors that are influencing that. One is just the low inventory that we have. And as an example, if you go back to, you know, summer's big selling time, if you go back to the summer of 2014, there were 10,000 homes on the market in San Diego. That's condos, detached homes, everything. Uh, by the next year, in 2015, there were 9,000. By 2016, there were 8,000. This year, in the summer, we have 6,200 homes. So we definitely, the inventory has gone down significantly. And at the same time, coupled with that, as Rick knows, the interest rates are still really low. And so buyers are scrambling, you know, lots of buyers and a few homes are scrambling to get that home. And in addition to being frustrated because they can't seem to win the house and you know with all the multiple offers that are out there I see buyers getting nervous too thinking you know with if interest rates go up am I gonna get priced out of this market am I not ever gonna be able to have that dream and buy that home so do you think like when the stuff that I'm seeing like these price reductions and some of these areas and stuff like that they are on in the higher end mm -hmm. you know of, of price points Do you think it's the segment of the market or do you think it's just these are people who just probably price the house way too high to begin with I mean is that there's a lot of that that goes on, you know, and I meet with a lot of sellers and they'll say, you know, yeah, but in this market, it's a seller's market. I, I know the comps say I should get, you know, a million for it, but let's push it up to a million too. I mean, what have we got to lose? So I think some sellers are on that high horse that you mentioned and maybe yeah. a little bit uh, ambitious with their pricing and then they see, okay, that's not going to work. But in the more, I'll call it average price points of, you know, 600, 800, 900,000, the homes are being snapped up, multiple offers. And so um, what I've tried to figure out for my buyers is, how do I help you win the house? How do I help you be the buyer that gets the house when there's eight other offers? And there are actually some things that a buyer can do. Well, let's talk about those happen. things because I think that's important. You know, if it's, and we know that this has been the state of the market for years. Yes. Now. That's and, right. And, you know, it, 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 that's what's probably causing some of the sellers to get a little greedy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're going to get a little greedy and say, ah, well, what difference does it make sure you put out here? I think every seller should just list the house for a dollar <laughs> and see what happens. Right. Or we shouldn't even have listing prices. Right. Like, this house is for sale. Yeah. Right. Bring your offers. That's you know? right, yeah. Um, but it's also good to communicate with people like, this is where we're at. We're in this range, uh, you know, of what we will accept. That's right. what a listing price is, right? Listing right. prices will accept this price. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to. Right. You could come make a full price offer and they could still say, nah. We have a overlist offer over here, right. so it does. It's not a buy it now. This is an eBay, but you know it does. It does give you an idea of what they would accept. And yes. Typically, a full price offer will get you the house. But in some of these price mm -hmm. ranges, in some of these areas, with some of these properties, that isn't even enough. 
So you have to do more than that, right? That's right. Yes. And I mean, I, it would be a really short segment if I said, well, the way to get the house is to write the highest offer. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're <laughs> done. <laughs> but obviously, that's not always possible. And sometimes, as you mentioned, that isn't even mm -hmm. what gets the house for you. So I kind of categorize it in three ways for, for my buyers. I say, look, there are the financial things you can do, and that's where it comes into play a lot. There are the contractual things you can do when you write the offer, and then there's that whole emotional side of things for a seller. So, you know, if we kind of look at each of those individually on the financial side, um, as a buyer, you want to come in pre-approved for sure. You want to have met with a lender like Rick. Mm -hmm. You want to know what you can afford. You want to have a nice, strong pre-approval letter that you bring to the seller. Uh, you also want to provide a proof of funds when you write the offer. In other words, your bank statement. So if you're saying in your offer, hey, we're going to put 100 grand down on the house, you need to provide proof of funds with the offer and in my opinion, higher than your down payment so that the seller has mm. that feeling, okay, this guy really does have a hundred grand or he's got two hundred grand, even better, because if you come in kind of by the skin of your teeth and you only give proof of funds for your exact down payment, the seller may, may feel like, well, what if that guy has a little financial hiccup along the way now, he can't buy my house and I'm an escrow with him? So you've got pre-approval, proof of funds, and then I always ask Rick to call the seller's agent and have a little chit chat about the right. the buyers. When, when we put in the offer, I mean, uh, I, it, I, I in part learned that from Lisa because Lisa will all have a conversation with her and she said, oh yeah, I just sold this home and I, I got a call from uh, the, the buyer's loan officer and she was impressed. And she was like, wow, this is a great idea, you know? And, and the whole transaction went smooth and, and, and it mm -hmm. started with, okay, I feel good about this offer because the, loan officer was proactive in getting in touch with her and letting her know what he had done to make sure the client was prepared to buy that house at this point. And so I started doing that on pretty much every offer. I mean, it, it's up to the agent. Some of the agents will say, no, don't call right now. You know, I don't know why, but, but that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, but most of them are like, yeah, get after them. And so mm -hmm. I'll be aggressive. I, I try and get that agent on the phone right away and say, hey, you have an offer in front of you and someone who is more than qualified to buy it for these reasons. And this is important because it's, as the listing agent, let's go to the other side. Because yes, that's who you're, you're trying to get the, in the good graces of. Mm -hmm. right. They are not always picking the highest offer, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. They're picking a lot of times the one that they think is the most likely to, to come through, to yes. follow through. Right. So who's the most likely one to follow through? Is it someone who just emailed over an offer and is just kind of like throwing mud against the wall? Right. Uh, is it someone who's calling you every day mm -hmm. right. saying, we really want this house. Have you looked at our offer? You right. know, my, my loan officer called you. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm calling you again as the agent. Uh, we're really interested in this house. They, a lot of times, you know, sellers will choose a, an offer that's not the highest because they feel it is the most likely to close because as the, as the listing agent, right, and you can speak to this, yes. there's pressure. When there's like 12, <laughs> 20 offers. You better pick the right one. <laughs> yeah. one that closes, right. at that's least, right. you know, like right. if you just pick the highest one and it doesn't close, now all of a sudden you're, you're screwed up. Right. That's you right. picked the wrong offer. That's right. We have the wrong agent here, you know, so <laughs> you gotta pick one that's gonna go through because your clients, which are the sellers, are making plans to vacate the property. Right. And once you accept that offer, everyone's expecting that. Wheels are in motion, movers are scheduled, stuff's right. going in boxes. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal to pick one that's going to go through. I think one of the things too, Rick, with you and Cornerstone Mortgage Group, you guys have a very good reputation, um, extremely good systems, yep. you know, mortgage banking, um, and just being able to get loans done quickly, smoothly, easily, incredible systems that yep. Sean Cahan, uh, the mortgage geek, has perfected over there yep. uh, with his team. And um, you guys all use that same system, which is a, it's a wild thing. I've seen it personally. Yeah, which yeah is, it is a wild it's, thing. It's, it's yeah. nutty. <laughs> but he's figured it out. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it changes all the time, a little bit here, a little bit there, just yeah. like everything. But yeah. but the the it, it's great. It works. Yeah, it, it does. works. And uh, lucky to have it. Yeah. And we actually have a situation right now where I'm actually representing the buyer and the seller. And that's always a little bit tricky for agents, but I'm doing this in this case. And the buyers live out of the country, so adding to the complexity. And they were getting their loan through one of the big banks, I uh, won't name which one. And they had a relationship with that bank. So before I suggested to the seller, we accept this offer from my buyer. I said, we want to get the buyers cross-qualified with Rick Sidley at Cornerstone. 
Rick did a lot of upfront work, came back, said, yep, I think they're good to go. Well, now we're in escrow, we're about day 20, and it turns out the big bank can't do it for this buyer, not because of the buyer's qualifications, but because of an internal policy that the big bank has. So I called Rick yesterday and I said, hey, I don't know if you brought your Superman cape with you to the office <laughs> today, but if not, you need to go home and get it because we got to <laughs> save this. And so he's jumped in and I think we're, I think we're gonna close in two weeks, so. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. So Saving yeah, for the buyers, Saving have the, the right lender and get right. your lender to make the call. Let's be honest, the big banks aren't good at this. They're just not good at, at, at mortgage loans. It, it's not their it's not their thing really. anymore. Yeah. They want you to bring your money to them so they can hold it. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, that includes your investments. Right. That's what the banks have become. Mm -hmm. um, now they may buy mortgage paper later once it's been, you know, qualified right. and, you know, underwritten and sealed mm -hmm. and it's in a nice right. neat package. They might buy a hundred mortgages, you know, but they don't want to give you a mortgage because there's too much liability. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and they're basically, they've been a target practice for, you know, the government to slap fines on them for stuff in the mortgage space. It's hard to do it all correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's such big entities that these big banks are pretty much like the government themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would encourage most, most people, unless you have absolutely no desire to have it move quickly, <laughs> effectively <laughs> and efficiently. Right. If none of that matters to you, yeah. stick with your big bank. But if it if it does matter to you, <laughs> yeah. I highly recommend going another direction. I agree, hundred um, percent. And that's so. just I that, think that's just a reality of their business model now, mm -hmm. and why you know great mortgage banks um, like Cornerstone and mortgage bankers mm -hmm. like Rick um, are able to take advantage of uh, this marketplace and really mm -hmm. make things happen. Like imagine if that buyer had gone with him initially. Oh, be, be done. the headache right. of the last be week done. would be, have not happened. Right. Yeah. right. So yeah. a lot of stress removed, mm -hmm. things yeah. going smoothly. That's what you really want at the end of the day. Once everybody's agreed on price and stuff, it's like, okay, let's bang out this paperwork. Yeah. Can we do that? Let's get this done now. Can we? Yeah, we've, mm -hmm. we've agreed. Let's just, let's knock this thing out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need any more stress. The stress was in the negotiation and getting it through and all that stuff. Yeah. Right. We're done with that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or we should be ideally. Yeah. Um, but if you're, if you're working with a big bank, that may not be the case. So I think definitely who you work with on the mortgage side is really mm -hmm. important. Right. And um, I think I mentioned the proof of funds, you know, have pr showing the seller that you're qualified for that. Also, when you write an offer as a buyer, you're going to put in on the first page of the offer, what's your earnest money deposit? You know, how much are you going to put down to get the ball rolling and deposit with escrow? And it really is helpful for sellers if you put in about 3% earnest money deposit. And the reason that's important, some people feel like, well, what's it really matter? I mean, the seller doesn't get that anyway, you know, until we close escrow. Because the more skin you have in the game as a buyer, the more apt you are to stay in the game. So once you get into escrow and as a buyer, you remove all your contingencies, it's a lot harder for you to walk away from 20 grand than five grand. So a seller's looking at offers that Correct. may be the exact same price and buyer one is willing to put $20,000 into escrow on day one, that's a, there's a comfort level to that versus buyer two at 5,000. So definitely go with a higher earnest money deposit. And lastly, from a financial standpoint, you gotta be non-contingent in this market. So if, if you're a buyer and you have another property you have to sell in order to buy this one, go get that done, be non-contingent. Uh, I know moving twice is a pain in the neck, but you're not gonna get the house unless you're non-contingent. So those are kind of the financial aspects. And then, as I said, there's also contractual things. And if you have a good agent, they'll kind of know some of the tricks of the trade when you're sitting down to write the contract. Um, there are all these different contingencies with buying a house. One is the inspection. Shorten your inspection contingency to like 10 days as a buyer going in. So instead of the 17 days in the contract, let the seller know, hey, in 10 days, you're gonna know where I stand on this house. You're gonna know that I love it and I'm ready to go forward. So you can shorten that. You can also sometimes shorten your loan contingency, but you definitely wanna talk to your lender about that before you sign up for, yeah. him up for something. Yeah. But, and then another one that you can do that you really want to be sure to talk to your agent about though because there can be some financial ramifications. Remove your appraisal contingency. If you feel like this property is getting bid up and we the buyer are willing to pay more than it will appraise for, you might want to take the appraisal contingency out of the offer at the very, at the very start and that gives the seller some comfort level. And then little things like don't ask the seller to buy a home warranty for you. Buy your own home warranty. It's a few hundred dollars, but the seller looks at that as a real good faith um, you know, gesture that you're not asking them to do that. 
maybe you want to pay for the termite work. But again, you'd want to see that termite inspection report up front before you sign, you know, hey, yeah, I'll pay whatever yeah, the termite I mean, is. Yeah, you know, exactly. it could be thousands of dollars. But Little tricks of the trade, you maybe you can remove certain contingencies and keep others yes. right, as a backstop right. if need be. Right. right, but shorten things up to the extent that you can and um, you know, just show contractually going in, hey, we really want this house. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the most interesting aspects to my business in real estate is the psychiatry and the psychology of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the most interesting and the most fun and the most stressful and the most oh my God, mm -hmm. <laughs> parts of it is the psychology. So you know, when, you, when you're writing an offer and you know there are other buyers trying to win the house, write a personal letter to the seller because for a lot of sellers it's a very emotional decision if they've lived there a long time or they've raised their family there or they grew old with their spouse in the house i mean it's it's a home it's not a house so we plan on not changing anything and we, lo we love the pink carpet and the exactly brocade drapery <laughs> as it is we'll send you pictures we'll post them on facebook uh, well, you're 100 percent right though. yeah you want to you know dear homeowners of one two three main street you know this is all the things we love about your house we've been looking forever this is the perfect house and and specifically what you like about it and then tell them about yourself as well. You know, what, what you do, where you come from, how long you plan to live there, and definitely include photos. And I actually have kind of a funny story that happened to me recently when I was on the listing side. Um, we had man, seven offers maybe. Two of the buyers put letters in, which was great, with pictures of their, their family, and one of the buyers put in a picture of their dog. Well, their dog was a German Shepherd, happened to be. And so my sellers were looking at everything, and the sellers were, well, look, they have a German Shepherd. <laughs> we had a German Shepherd. As a matter of fact, we had a German Shepherd when we bought this house. We're going with them. Wow. So the picture yeah. of the dog. <laughs> the dog did <laughs> the it. Dog yeah. the, the, house, so. the dog got them the house. That's how crazy this market is it right is there. It is crazy, yeah. yeah. The dog the got them the house. The dog did it. <laughs> Can you imagine if they had a, a, a poodle? A chihuahua yeah, or something, yeah, right. It just wouldn't, wouldn't have worked <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's crazy, but it's, it's, it's also interesting because there's the psychology aspect of, you know, and there's also the, the financials, there's the mm -hmm. hard, you know, things that matter. That matter. People are looking at. Um, I think the overall feeling is also really important, right? Mm -hmm. The feeling that you exude from the lender, from your agent. letter from the agent, you know, to those mm -hmm. people, they feel comfortable working with you because, right. again, that selling agent is the one who's pretty much they're advising that the homeowner, the seller, is making the decision, mm -hmm. but they're getting they're really listening to their agent a lot mm -hmm. in these cases. And if they have a good feeling about you, mm -hmm. they're gonna say, you know what, these people seem to really have their act together. They seem organized. They seem like they've done this before. Mm -hmm. You know, that that goes a long way um, in a, in a market where there's. There's some agents that maybe don't seem like, even if they have, mm -hmm. don't seem like they've done yeah. it before. Or don't yeah. seem that they care. And you know, that yeah. brings up another good point, Derek, is working with an agent who is experienced and who's familiar with the area and the neighborhoods that you wanna buy a home in. Because, um, for example, I, d I, l I work a lot in Poway and Rancho Bernardo, and so when I'm representing a buyer and I write an offer on a home in that area, chances are really good I know the listing agent. I've probably done transactions with that person. At a minimum, we've networked, we've been in caravan together. I have a reputation in the area, and if all things are equal, I know that listing agent, just as I do when I'm the listing agent, is gonna say, hey, this agent, she knows what she's doing, she, she can get it done, she doesn't make mistakes, she will make this happen for you. This agent, never heard of him. I, you know, I, I'm sure he's fine, but I can tell you this agent will get it done. And at the end of the day, that's what a seller wants. They want to get it done. They want the house sold. Like you said, the stuff's in storage. Right. We, <laughs> you know, we're trying to get in our new house. We want it done. <laughs> so, so maybe not a buyer's market just yet. Maybe not quite maybe yet. Maybe not yeah. a buyer's market just yet, but I have one more question for you. Okay. Because we're talking about, you know, if you are buying, um, to not have a contingent situation, not putting mm -hmm. in a contingent offer like, hey, we'll buy your house if our house sells. Mm -hmm. That's what that means, right? Right. You're saying, go ahead and sell your house first. Um, does it help if you're putting in an offer? Let's say I, I listened to your advice today and I said, you know what? She's right. We need to go ahead and sell the house, honey. We're never going to get our offer accepted if we don't. I go and we sell the house. Maybe we're in escrow. Now I'm writing offers over here because I don't want to move twice if I can avoid it. Mm -hmm. Is that seen by the listing agent as a high motivating factor if you know, we say, hey, our property that we live in is already in escrow. We have to move by this date. Mm -hmm. Is that seen as, as like a motivation for like, hey, maybe we should look at this offer because these people are, are going to be displaced. They need to move in 
by a certain date? Well, you know, there's varying degrees of contingent. You know, there's super contingent, whereas, uh, you know, yeah, we still have our house, we haven't listed it, we're not on the market, but we want to buy yours. That's really contingent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then yeah. then yeah. there's the next level of, yeah. hey, we've taken the step, we have our house on the market. It's not sold yet, you know, but, it, you know, we're, we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Then there's what you mentioned. Hey, we're in escrow. We have a buyer. We're in escrow. We're super serious. We're closing on, you know, the 30th. That's a little less contingent, but still not as good as the person who says, here's my bank account. Look, there's the half a million dollars. I sold my house that's in the bank. I can move anytime. Because what can happen in your case is you're an escrow on your house and you have a buyer. What if that buyer decides not to buy your house or they can't get their loan and they don't have Rick to swoop in and save you know the save the day? Yeah, That's true. So you're, you're, as, risk you're as least contingent as you can be, but you're still just, you know, it's like a little pregnant. You're a little contingent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're a little pregnant, you're still pregnant. Yeah. You're little, still pregnant, little right? Contingent, <laughs> you're still contingent. Yeah, but I it's a great that. question. That makes sense. There, there is, from the loan side of things, uh, a way to swoop in on those. When the contingencies are removed, I can actually close the loan before their house sells. I really? like that. Yeah. So after the contingencies are removed on their current property, but before it is sold. Even they if they can need close it for financing, purchase, correct. you can close on the purchase. Right, but the, 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 the debt ratio wise, they still have to have the down payment. They still have to have the cash. Still so have to have the down payment. They have okay. to have the cash available to put down on the new place. But from a debt to income ratio standpoint, assuming they can't afford both homes at the same time, that's huge. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's more cornerstone wizardry. Yeah. That's, that's right. It's like, <laughs> right. It's, yeah, not yeah, everybody's going to do that for you. You do that as, so. as good as it sounds. It, it rarely, it, it, we rarely have to execute on it because usually it just works out. The right. timing works out, right? But if Where, you need to, but if you need to, the opportunity you pull the cord. There. Correct. You can do that. Right. Tremendous stuff. This has been a great education. Thank you guys so much for coming yeah, in today. Yeah. Really, Thanks really for really having appreciate us. Your time. Appreciate Thank it. Well, it's not a buyer's market yet. <laughs> maybe next year. But hey, yeah. <laughs> maybe, we maybe not. Help. We've been saying this since what, 13 or 14? Yeah, 13, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Goodness gracious, if you want to buy a house, you can afford it, I say do it now. Yes, yes. please. Call Pretty me. Pretty much, plain and simple. <laughs> yeah, we've got two yeah. great people here for you to call. Thanks for tuning Thanks. in. We just made you smarter than everyone else.